A continuous stream of moisture coming out of the northwest. I'll show you how much snow will fall in the valleys and the mountains in my forecast coming up. Extreme avalanche danger is not just impacting the backcountry anymore. If you break the rules up here, you could be in life or death danger. Absolutely. The risk to anyone heading up the canyons and the strict safety measure starting in just hours. Plus, 2 News investigates the system letting some repeat offenders dodge jail time and the frightening consequences. I would definitely say pure evil. 2 News at 10 starts right now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to 2 News at 10. We start tonight with a live look at some of the snow that's coming down right now in the Ogden area. That definitely isn't the only place that's going to be getting a lot of snow and a lot of powder tonight. That's right. We have team coverage for you with Jamie McGriff giving us live updates on the impacts from the storm. Jeremy Harris covering the dangers that are in Little Cottonwood Canyon right now. First, though, we want to go to Sterling with the very latest on who gets what and when. Well, right now, guys, we're getting what we call snow squalls that are moving through the Wasatch Front. These are very, very strong storms that are moving through. So you can see uh, the roads are starting to be snow packed. This is Washington Boulevard and 2600 North up close to North Ogden. You can see the snow is coming down pretty hard there. Visibility is reduced. And here's a look at the uh, radar. The cool thing about this is you can see some of these places where before it turns to snow, look how strong these storms are. You can see the red in the middle of some of these showers. So they're very strong storms. And then they turn to snow. It comes down very hard, reduces the visibility very quickly, and that's what's going on from Brigham City South. And if you're headed over Sardine Canyon, traction devices are now required in Sardine Canyon. So that means uh, chains or four-wheel drive or some kind of traction device. In the Salt Lake Valley, we're starting to fill in here, as you can see. So we'll see some of these squalls moving through with reduced visibility. And as we look off to the north and west, we've got plenty of moisture headed this way. It's going to continue to increase. We're going to continue to see very cold temperatures tonight as they continue to fall. Provo's down to 31 now, Logan 32. Wendover's still 43, but we've cooled down to at least, we were in the upper 30s in Salt Lake just an hour ago. Now it's down to 35. So we will see that rain anywhere along the Wasatch Front changing to snow tonight. Amounts are going to be significant in some places and not so significant in others. But some of that cold Arctic air, as you can see right there, we'll talk more about that coming up in just a couple of minutes. All right, Sterling, thanks. Just to take a look at how widespread the winter weather really is across the country, 150 million people in 25 states are under some type of watch, warning, or advisory tonight. Especially when you look at the south, surprising there. Regions all across the nation are getting snow, some getting a whole lot more than they're really used to. Rolling power blackouts ordered across Texas today. This is a winter storm, and frigid temperatures gripped the state and also knocked out service to more than 3.8 million customers. You're also looking at inches and inches of snow in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Oregon. I'm Jamie McGriff on the live desk. Close to 3,000 customers in Grantsville are in the dark right now. And this is an outage map from Rocky Mountain Power. The power company tweeted a short time ago saying that there's a large power outage impacting 2,997 customers in Grantsville, Utah. The cause of the outage is due to a vehicle accident. Police in the area say that a power pole was split. Rocky Mountain Power estimates the power being restored around 1.30 Tuesday morning. Grantsville PD says one person was taken by ambulance to the hospital. UHP troopers have responded to 309 crashes since Saturday morning, and they're asking drivers to be safe, buckle up, slow down, and give yourself plenty of space. Jamie, thank you. Right now, police cruisers are pulling into place, and Little Cottonwood Canyon is now off limits to just about everybody. Yeah, the avalanche danger is so high, there's very good potential of people getting caught in a slide. Jeremy Harris is in the canyon taking a look at what's going on tonight. Right now is prime time in Little Cottonwood, not just for skiing, but also for the army of people whose job it is to keep everyone here safe. You know, it's one thing to ask people to be patient. It's another to say, if you break the rules up here, you could be in life or death danger. Absolutely. Mike uh, is the Alta Town Marshal, and what he says here goes. Yeah. Avalanche hazard in the Wasatch has been going up and up. He says interlodge orders will be in effect overnight as avalanche dangers push extreme. Making it uh, actually a criminal offense to be outdoors when interlodge is in effect. That closure goes into effect at 11. An avalanche in the town of Alta could be deadly, which is why sleeping in cars or vans up here is prohibited. We've had so many people inquiring, where, where can I sleep in my car or my van up here tonight? And the answer is always, you can't do that. You're going to have to return to the valley. Avalanche control crews say they plan to be here early in the morning. 
And even if it takes a while, Mike says the safety measures that are in place are necessary to keep visitors out of harm's way. Should you be in a vehicle and hit by a natural or man-made avalanche during uh, mitigation work, uh, your chances of surviving that incident would be relatively low. Now, Jeremy tells us for those who are already in place up in the canyon, either people that live there or maybe some people at Alta or Snowbird, they're going to need to stay indoors and wait for word from authorities on when Interlodge is lifted. A violation of Interlodge could get you a fine. Fortunately, it's, I've seen it cost people their lives. A Utah Highway Patrol trooper is sharing what he's seen out on our snowy Utah roads when people drive with bald tires. Worn treads dramatically increase your chance of sliding off the road. Utah requires many two-wheel vehicles under 12,000 pounds to have certified snow tires, but not everyone's checking. You can identify them by the Snowflake logo on the tire sidewall. And all that winter weather may be impacting the oil industry for the first time in more than a year. U.S. oil is now above $60 a barrel. The rise is mostly due to economic optimism, the vaccine rollout, and winter weather. The last time the price of West Texas oil was higher than $60 was January 7th of 2020. That was when reports of coronavirus infections began to spread in our country. New tonight at 10, we're working right now to learn a little bit more about a natural gas leak, apparently at Olympus Hill Shopping Center. That's just off of Wasatch Boulevard. We've confirmed that the Unified Fire Authority, working with Dominion Energy, and also Unified Police to try to secure that area. Unified Fire also tells us that they've evacuated some of the dozen businesses that were open at the time. Dominion investigating the source of the gas leak right now. There are no injuries and no immediate concern. Well, what if the recent COVID vaccines are not as effective against some of these new mutations? It's an issue vaccine makers are aware could happen. Jim Spiewak found out there is a plan to test new versions of this vaccine. Jim? Yeah, updating this vaccine, if it's necessary, is less about starting at square one and more about staying in front of the curve of keeping it as effective as possible. And to do that, tweaking the current COVID-19 vaccine might be necessary. Yeah, I was diagnosed. July 27th. COVID symptoms forced Lauren the plant to go on oxygen for two and a half months. My health significantly took a very significant decline. I mean, I was barely able to walk up and down these stairs. Lauren has since received both Moderna vaccine shots, but the manufacturers of mRNA vaccines are gearing up to update them just in case. We do have to react a bit, but we're well positioned to do that. The first process is catching when a mutation happens, and that's done in a process called sequencing, which Utah does pretty well. Once scientists know a mutation's genetics, updating the vaccine can happen in a matter of weeks. We're able to see this happening essentially in real time, and so then we're able to test how it might impact vaccines and make a decision about when we might want to update. Which doesn't happen in viruses like measles, where the same vaccine has been used for decades, but does happen a lot in faster mutating viruses like the flu. We have a global uh, genomic surveillance network for influenza, and we have that now for the virus that causes COVID-19 as well. Goldstein says, based on his research that he's seen, it's unlikely the current vaccines will become obsolete in a time frame that would set us back. So I don't think we're looking at a scenario where even if you've been vaccinated in six months, you're a sitting duck again. Which is good enough for Lauren, even if she has to get an updated shot at some point in the future. Let's go. I absolutely no thought. I will not do this again. But now, it's worth noting LaPlan is a healthcare worker, which is why she was eligible to get the vaccine. And you talk with experts and they say updating this vaccine if and when it's necessary is not going to require that lengthy clinical trial approval process that we saw the first time around. And the FDA is in the process right now of updating that framework to get a more seamless approval if and when this vaccine needs updating. We're live downtown tonight, Jim Spiewak, 2 News. Thank you, Jim. The Salt Lake County Health Department is announcing that they have more vaccines than expected, and they've opened some appointments for this week. If you'd like to schedule your vaccine, you can visit saltlakehealth.org, or you can also call the appointment phone line, which is on your screen. You must be 70 years or older and live in Salt Lake County to qualify for the vaccine. We continue to monitor the very latest developments as they happen during the pandemic. We'll have more right here on Channel 2 and always updates as we get them on KUTV.com. 
A new proposed resolution in the Utah legislature would declare racism a moral and public health crisis here in the state. The resolution would also affirm that lawmakers are working to reduce the long-term impact that racism has on the quality of life and health for citizens of color here in the state. This comes after an announcement last month from Utah's major health care providers declaring systemic racism a public health crisis here in the state of Utah. Crowded prisons versus treatments for addiction. The state is trying to figure out which is best. So your safety could be hanging in the balance here, and a high-profile case highlights exactly why. Two News investigative reporter Wendy Halloran started digging and discovered multiple missteps from different levels. Well, Heidi and Mark, tonight we are going to take you on an odyssey of failures that enabled a sexually violent predator with a history of opioid addiction to attack. A warning, this story contains graphic information. A mother's worst nightmare, her daughter snatched off the street. Armed with a knife, duct tape, drugs to disable his victim, and a camera to record the sexual assault. You even curious why you're here? Or do you already know? A former co-worker saw it coming. He had made a comment that he would kill me. Um, I went out and bought my first firearm. It wasn't the first time he viciously attacked. We were actually on, apparently, parole at the time that this occurred. There was an opportunity to prevent the unconscionable from happening, but he got a lucky break. I truly believe that I can be rehabilitated because I know it's in my heart. I would definitely say pure evil. That evil could have been stopped earlier. In 2008, Creed Lujan checked into the Crystal Inn. He lured a housekeeper into his room and strangled her. Then he twisted a towel into a weapon to strangle her more. He was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to three years to life. Six years later, he was granted parole. According to his parole agreement obtained by Two News, he is to obey all laws and notify his parole agent within 48 hours of being arrested or questioned by law enforcement. Go down the window. It's now July 26, 2019, and Creed Lujan is passed out behind the wheel of his car. Despite an attempt to drive off, Highway Patrol did arrest him for DUI, but he's not booked into jail and instead taken to the hospital. Two News investigates uncovered glaring failures. First, the UHP trooper failed to communicate to probation and parole that Lujan had been arrested. Lujan didn't tell his parole agent until two weeks later. It was more than six weeks before APMP told the parole board. Then they sent an email and recommended Lujan not be sent back to prison. Two News investigates uncovered that email just sat in the inbox. It was never printed or put in Lujan's file. To be clear, no members of the board were ever made aware Lujan had been arrested. And I'm shocked and I'm, I'm horrified that the system didn't work correctly. Attorney Chad Woolley's firm prosecuted the case for the city of South Salt Lake. Lujan was offered a deal. Specifically with Lujan, we wanted to get a conviction so that he could be, um, his parole could be revoked and he could get taken off the street. But that didn't happen. On November 27, 2019, Lujan pleaded guilty to impaired driving, no jail time, 12 months probation and ordered to get treatment. Exactly two months to the day, he set his sights on his next victim. Coming up in 60 seconds, the teenager who became Lujan's victim and issues with a new system in Utah that might have allowed it to happen. Nobody is, can sit back and say they're happy with everything that's happening with JRI. That's a clear message. I'm, I'm not happy either. Prepared. Winter weather coverage on 2 News. Welcome back. Before we went to break, we showed you how Craig Lujan violated the terms of his parole but was not sent back to prison. A new way of dealing with offenders leads to treatment instead of time behind bars. Wendy Halloran joining us again. And Wendy, it sounds like the system might be putting us all at risk. Well, the system focuses on treatment instead of incarceration for some offenders. But as you're about to see, sometimes those decisions can have life-changing consequences for the innocent. January 27, 2020.
Reed Lujan is captured on several doorbell cameras driving up and down. That's her right there. Ultimately kidnapping a 15-year-old girl threatening to kill her with a knife. I wish I got a better look at his hands. Drugging her, sexually assaulting her, and later dumping her at a bus stop near a high school. Okay, having these rights in mind, you wish... Lujan's brought in for questioning. Do you want to talk to me? Um... Lawyer. To spare the victim and her family from having to testify, Lujan took another plea deal. Sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. This is the victim's mom talking before he learned his fate. My daughter is 15 years old and has to grow up with this for the rest of her life, knowing that this man could possibly get out again. There's probably a very strong argument that says that that he should have been revoked on his parole and gone back to prison. Tom Ross is the new executive director of the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, the agency that came up with the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, or JRI. If you're buying in and believe that, that treatment is as important in this as incarcerating and locking offenders up, then somebody made a calculated risk based on the sentencing guidelines, based on best information that they had available, that either happened or somebody made a mistake at best. Treatment, it's one of the major tenets of JRI. The goal, to reduce the prison population and control costs by sentencing offenders to substance abuse and mental health treatment in lieu of time behind bars. But the system has been widely criticized. Nobody is can sit back and say they're happy with everything that's happening with JRI. That's a clear message. I'm, I'm not happy either. A legislative audit last year and this Project Gateway report both point out huge failures with the system. Among them, the fact that probation and parole agents' caseloads have significantly increased with a more violent, higher-risk perpetrator. Both reports also show recidivism rates have surged. Point blank, is the system working? If you're asking me, should we stop and go back, I would say no. Is this victimizing people? Y you are telling me that if we go back in the other direction, there will potentially be more victims. Is that correct? Well, I believe that more families are going to be distraught and torn up still. That's, that's going to continue. We cannot incarcerate our way out of this. Ross now has the task of improving the system to make sure things like what happened to this 15-year-old do not happen again. I can't say enough to bring back the safety and security that they had before this happened. I know that. Knowing what this child went through, and knowing it was so preventable just disgusted me to the point that I was physically sick over it. So what can be done? We asked adult probation and parole and the Board of Pardons and Parole to talk to us on camera about the Lujan case, but they declined. In a statement, the Board of Pardons and Parole said it takes responsibility for not getting the report about Lujan into the paper file. I know my mom heart is sick listening to this. I know a lot of people have questions. So, Wendy, when we have the new governor in office right now, Spencer Cox, do we know where he stands on this issue? We do. Governor Spencer Cox declined our request for comment, saying he was still studying the system. However, he did include $3 million in his proposed budget to hire more adult probation and parole agents. All right, Wendy, thank you. Definitely eye-opening watching that and seeing what our system does. For sure. All right. Uh, Sterling's keeping a close eye on all this weird weather that's been moving across the state. <laughs> Very active weather tonight. Let's take a look at what we're expecting for the mountains. And this is the big, the big issue right now with this whole storm pattern is the tremendous amount of snow that's being put in our mountains, and that is increasing the avalanche danger. 30 to 45 inches at Alta is what we're expecting. So what does that mean? As we go to the forecast, it means that the avalanche danger in the higher elevations is now considerable on every or on high, I should say, in every mountain area along the Wasatch Front and the western Uintas. And it's possible, it is possible, especially with these storms we've got coming across the mountains right now, that could actually get into the extreme category. So just stay out of the backcountry, period. Uh, that's just about all we can say about it. Just do that. Uh, here's a little time lapse today. You can see uh, the clouds this morning, and then they kind of lifted a little bit this afternoon, and you can actually see 
uh, the snow level along the mountains as, as the clouds lifted, but then they came back in again, and we've got snow showers again. This is up at the Red Butte Garden looking toward the south. But uh, here's, the, here's the fire hose right now. This is just like a big stream of moisture coming right into the Wasatch Mountains, and as it hits the mountains, comes across the lake, it lifts, and uh, these snow showers are very, very strong. But little squalls that are moving through, actually very, very reduced visibility in these squalls, and of course we have the issue in Sardine Canyon right now where chains are required or traction devices are required. We've got showers down around St. George. We've got some snow showers up in the higher elevations there, and this is going to fill in a little bit tonight as well, but mainly it'll be over the mountains and along I-15 and heading up into northern Utah. That's where most of this active weather is going to be, and I can show that to you on our future track. So we have this northwest flow, so it just keeps pushing this moisture up over the mountains. This is uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. You can still see we've got these scattered snow showers, and then this takes us into Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. Not much has changed, and we go all the way into Wednesday morning that still not much has changed. So we're going to continue to see pretty much the same weather pattern until we get a little break uh, between storms and the winds actually shift and go to the southwest for a little bit before they turn to the northwest once again, and that'll be our next storm coming in. Temperatures tomorrow will be in the 30s pretty much across the entire state except for the lower deserts and the mountains will be in the 20s. We're talking about 20 degrees at 9 a.m., 21 at noon, 20 at 3 p.m. with moderate to heavy snow in those snow bands. The forecast for St. George, 56, goes to 51. It should stay dry in St. George, and uh, the weekend looks nice, 57, 58, and breezy, back to 63 on Monday. For Salt Lake City, we've got 38 tomorrow, 36 or 35 on Wednesday, 38 on Thursday, more rain and snow possible on Friday, and then the weekend looks fairly dry with temperatures in the 40s. Overnight lows will be in the 30s. My guaranteed forecast for tomorrow is 38 degrees, and we got the forecast right last Friday. So Todd Carter of West Valley is the winner of a Sterling Set of Wood umbrella. Well, this week, a historical mission to Mars begins its next big chapter. We take a look at the challenges ahead and why the mission is so important. At Big O Tires. Welcome back. A push on Utah's Capitol Hill to crack down on the release of mugshots is gaining some momentum. The bill has some big backers and some powerful arguments, but opponents say the lawmakers could be traveling down a slippery slope. Yeah, we worry this is a first step to shut down access to the entire criminal justice system, which would be a very, very, very bad step for our country. When, when we put someone's mugshot out there that hasn't been convicted and their life is destroyed because of it, what have we really done for the public good? The bill is sitting in the Utah Senate now. It has not yet been scheduled for a committee hearing. There are two and a half weeks to go in this legislative sessions before it ends. Well, NASA is primed to make some history in its search for signs of ancient life on Mars. The Perseverance rover is nearing the end of its months-long trip to the Red Planet. If it survives a daring descent on Thursday, it'll embark on a two-year mission to probe a crater about the size of Lake Tahoe that was once a lake of water. NASA believes it could hold evidence of past life forms. The landing attempt will happen Thursday afternoon around 2 o'clock Mountain Time. That mission will pave the way for future manned missions to the Red Planet and our own moon, the Perseverance rover has terrain relative navigation that enables it to land where other technology has not been able to go. A new experiment called MOXIE hopes to produce oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the Mars atmosphere. Boy, the Jazz are showing a little MOXIE right now. They're about to complete their homestand with a sweep. How about that? How they plan? Uh, pretty darn good. Tonight, Philadelphia comes to Salt Lake City on President's Day. Post game react and highlights coming your way when we're talking sports next. Signer talking sports. Some time off the ticker. Senior open look for three. Got it again. Hey, Clippers playing tonight without Kawhi Leonard, without Paul George against the Heat. Same team the Jazz beat on Saturday. But this one's been going back and forth all night. Clippers just moments ago pulled away late. They won it 125 to 118. The Jazz will play there Thursday, Wednesday, and Friday. Right now, the Jazz are the unanimous leader among several power uh, rankings this uh, today. I mean, CBS, ESPN, all sorts of them. And tonight, they're trying to live up to that ranking. Taking on the 76ers. Let me take you to the highlights of that one. Final game of the homestand of full disclosure. Sixers best player, Joel Embiid, out for the game. Off the turnover. Look at this. Here comes Jordan Clarkson. Oh, boy, would he have a night. 
hits the pull up three. Shot of the night's got to be this one, though. I love this. Watch Bogdanovich. Kind of gets the ball stuck and just throws it up there. It goes in. Jazz scored 72 and a half. How about we kick off the second half with some D? Ingles comes up with a big block on Curry's three. Coach Quinn's got to love that. He loves D. And then right to the end of the game, Jazz, you know, Sixers just cannot handle the three point shooting. Clarkson, that was his eighth three and his 40th point lead back tonight. Here's the dagger. Rudy, the flush. Jazz went at 134 to 123. 40 points for Clarkson. The most for a Jazz sub since Thurl Bailey back in 1988. He's confident to begin with, but I think that takes him um, to a really good place mentally. And I just like the things, the other things he's trying to do as well. I think the way that he's thrown himself into the game, you know, you see him on the offensive glass, um, you see him trying to defend, you know, I think that just, that helps, you know, that helps him stay focused and, you know, he doesn't meet, need, he doesn't need to be too open, you know, to, to be aggressive and shoot the ball. And that's what we want. That's what his teammates want to. All right, we got a lot more highlights of this one coming up for you. Jazz and 76ers coming your way, plus much more post-game reaction. We should hear from Clarkson as well. And also Steve Young, former Cougar quarterback, on Zach Wilson, former Cougar quarterback. That's all coming up in three minutes, KMYU and stream at KUTV.com. And with tonight's Jazz game on a Monday, Talking Jazz shifts to tomorrow night. The radio voice of the Jazz, David Locke, will join me. Talking Jazz tomorrow night on KMYU. And, yes, also streamed at KUTV.com. And the Jazz just keep on winning. No kidding. And Jordan Clarkson, what a night. Yeah, we love it. Keep up the great work, Jazz. <sighs> We're behind you. All right, Dave, thank you. And, uh, hey, be careful tomorrow. That's what you might be looking at.